Thanks for joining us on this episode where we're going to talk about the Stardust Ranch in Arizona. So what I'll do is I'll just start with the history of the ranch and then we'll let the man himself tell us in his own words. So we're fortunate enough today to have John Edmonds, the owner of the Stardust Ranch in Arizona, joining us. And they will be joining us a little bit later on in the podcast where we will be talking to him about all things alien and paranormal so i'll just talk about how we get up to to now so the ranch is based as mentioned in arizona john and his wife run a sanctuary for animals and they take in uh, stray horses and all types of unwanted cattle etc uh, and look after them in the ranch so on the day of moving John and his wife turn up at the ranch. So John's walking around and he sees this guy walking towards him. Uh, and he walks up to him. And he's a vagrant looking guy. He's got a ponytail or whatnot. Uh, and he's got a machete with him. And John's like, who are you? He goes, oh, I live here. And John's like, uh, I've just bought the ranch. I, I can't have you living here. And the vagrant guy goes, I work on the property. John again is like, oh, well, I've just bought the ranch. I don't need any help. What do you do? And this vagrant guy looks him in the eye and says, I kill the monsters. So John, <laughs> what do you even say to that? So John's a bit taken back by that and says, look, I don't know what's going on, but I, I don't need your help. Just get your stuff and, and go. The guy walks off. That's the last we hear of him. There's no story. After that encounter, John's a bit, a bit taken back and thinks nothing of it. Uh, and they just start getting on with their life and, and things are all good. Then the weirdness starts. I won't go into too much detail because John does start talking about it when we when we interview him. But just to give sort of a top level of what he does talk about, his wife gets abducted on a nightly basis by these grey aliens. He has AK-47 shootouts in the back garden firing at alien spacecraft. He decides that machine guns do not work when trying to kill these grey aliens so he takes to a samurai sword he then proceeds to start killing these things he can preempt the movement of the aliens and even manages to take a sample of a dead alien off the uh, samurai sword keeps one in his freezer and sends it off for analysis again I'll let John talk about that when we get to it but this this ranch is proper strange. Ghost Adventures have been there. They've done an investigation. There's a special of it on YouTube and all the various viewing platforms. Um, so there's definite interest in this guy and in the ranch. So we were fortunate enough to, to speak to John. The interview's coming up now where he talks a little bit more about what's going on at the ranch now and some of the stories that you won't have heard him talk about before. Um, I found it fascinating. I know you did as well, Ash. Yeah, it's um, insane. Yeah. And this guy, if everything he says is true, this guy has had the most insane experience that I don't think will ever be repeated. Skinwalker Ranch. Definitely. <laughs> Skinwalker Ranch is no comparison to Stardust Ranch. Stardust Ranch is like Skinwalker Ranch on acid. And as John mentions, it's like a one-stop <laughs> shop of everything paranormal. So um, for the next sort of hour, we, we talk to John, and it's up to you guys to make up your own minds as to what's happened uh, and if you believe him. Uh, as you'll see, John is quite adamant that he doesn't care. If people don't believe him, he knows what happened or, and is happening on the ranch. So we'll hand over and would appreciate your thoughts on what you think has gone on. I think the encounters you've had and the, everything that's happened to you since buying the ranch has just been mind-blowing in terms of just like completely different to some of the other sort of UFO and paranormal experiences that the, a well, lot Craig, of... I tell everybody this is like one stop shopping as yeah. far as the paranormal goes, you know, and I, I you know, over the years, I, I, you know, went through a lot of different stages, almost like, the, you know, going through grief. 
yeah. because, you know, I had to learn how to accept it, deal with it, mm-hmm. um, and then see it in perspective. And eventually I've gotten to the point now where I see the whole thing as an educational process yeah. to become somebody to, you know, do bigger things in the world. I mean, I, you know, I've always, you know, I, I became a social worker and a psychiatric therapist, uh, yeah. you know, educationally with the idea that I wanted to help people and, and do good in the world. Mm-hmm. And this ranch has really become sort of the hands-on experience for, you know, having to even take it to a larger level. So how how do you come to accept what's happening? Because you, you mentioned that you've come to accept it. How, how does one go about accepting the phenomenal stuff that's been happening to you and your wife and, and the ranch? Well, I've had to see it in a bigger perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when I first, you know, decided to buy this ranch, I bought it. I saved up from the time I was, you know, seven or eight years old on to buy a ranch out west. You know, me growing up in Chicago and, uh, you know, the the, uh, middle part of the country, I, you know, I had always wanted to have horses and I'd always wanted to to live sort of the, you know, cowboy uh, lifestyle, you know, that we grew up, you know, seeing back in the 50s and 60s, you know. And and so uh, finally, when I got my chance to do it, you know, I jumped on it and did it. And then when I found out that I bought the ranch from hell, uh, I was just like, oh, my God, you know, what have I done? I mean, this is not the dream that I signed on for. This is like the science fiction, you know, crazy dream. Yeah. And I don't want this, you know, can I like give it back? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let so, me trade it in for bananas or something, you know, yeah, so, but it didn't work out that way. It was like, no. hey, you know what, you know, find your keepers, buddy. You know, you bought it, it's yours. And so, I had to this, literally, you know, get over my anger about that. I had a yeah. lot of anger, uh, yeah. rage about it. Did. And, you know, th- these uh, little grays showing up and hurting my animals and, you know, coming after me and coming after my wife. I was furious for years. I was just absolutely in a major state of rage. And all I wanted to do was kill as many of them as possible. Yeah. And uh, so I did, you know, I mean, they came <laughs> and they, they, you know, they, they created, you know, trouble and I took it out on them directly. So how many, how many greys do you think you've killed over the years? 19 pretty much for sure. Um, maybe a few more. I mean, I, I really don't know. It's not like, you know, it's not like a batting average. I'm I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's just one of those things, you know, it's, it's not football. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I just, uh, I, all I've done is defend my property, defend my family and defend myself. And, you know, they just kept coming. And, you know, finally, you know, we were fortunate enough to have somebody that was able to introduce us to some other species. Arizona, Arizona is full of ETs. I, I you know, I, and everything I say, I can, well, I can't really document it. It's not like I have, you know, like, uh, you know, postcards with me with a bunch of ETs on them or something. But, um, you know, we, we were fortunate enough to get introduced to a few different species. And it was through a mutual trust arrangement with other individuals that they knew and they trusted that person and that person introduced me. And ever since then, we've had every couple of years, we've kind of had one or two meetings and sat down and discussed things and, you know, gone over things. And they've told me their points of view on a few things and I've told them mine and uh, it's been good. I mean, we've, I, I've learned so much over the last few years, you know, and it's why I tell people that there's nothing on this planet that we can't solve if we take responsibility for it. You know, there, there's no country on earth that we can't work with the people themselves. I don't give a damn about the governments. You know, the governments are on their own, but yeah. we can work with the people to create solutions. And there's nothing that we can't do if we work together, you know, See, and, and, There's such a standard of living that just needs to be achieved universally. Everybody needs to be able to have options for good housing, you know, clean, healthy food and water, uh, you know, safety and and a chance to to make something out of their lives that's significant and something that uh, is beneficial, you know, something they can be proud of, have a good reason for being alive other than just to take up space. You know, we can do all that right now. We can do every bit of that right now. You know, I've set up a trust fund, uh, literally, in, in, and mostly so far, it's just little bits of money that I've thrown in it. But the idea 
is to create teams of people to start working on some of these world problems, you know, because we have the answers. I have the answers. And it's not about me. Believe me, I'm not interested in fame. I'm not interested in fortune. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in creating a better world. And we can do it. Cool. I do completely agree with you. Um, just going back to where you talked about the different races. Um, mm-hmm. you, and you said you were introduced to those races by people. Were right. they were they humans that have introduced you to those races? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been a little bit of both. Uh, you know, the greys, as far as I'm concerned, are, are like the bad guys, the gang members, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're absolutely of no use. Um, at least I haven't met any that were okay under any circumstances. Um, we have met uh, a lot of Pleiadians uh, over the years, some that I've known for over 20 years, and they're phenomenal individuals. They have phenomenal abilities. They're, they're incredibly intelligent, uh, but they're, they're very careful about who they associate with because of the fact that there's such a stigma that goes with being from an off world, you know, existence. Um, and, and there are so many races that have lived here for thousands of years. I mean, it, you know, it's not like these are, are, you know, coming in by spaceship and, and, you know, just visiting. I mean, I'm sure that happens too, but um, they've been here, you know, they're, they're as much part of this world and, you know, almost at this point, you know, just human yeah. as anybody else. So do, what kind of intelligent communication have you had with them? Do they, do they? I've, I've sat down with them for hours at a time. I, I mean, many hours, you know, that come and go. Uh, we, we've done, in some cases, uh, you know, we've taken trips and, and gone places and done things. Okay. So they're, they're, I mean, you can't tell the difference between them and anybody else, really. You know, the only reason you know that they're not human is because if they confide in you and they tell you, they will do things to demonstrate to you abilities that, that we don't have. What what kind of abilities do they show you? Um, in some cases that I've seen personally, uh, under one particular set of circumstances, great strength, physical strength. Uh, uh, an individual that was in earth years, over 70 years old, uh, we were in a rock climbing situation in the Grand Canyon, and we had a mishap. And that yeah. one person raised uh, like eight of us on a rope with one arm and one hand while holding on to the other end and, and uh, skinnying up the rope, dragging us with him. Oh, wow. So do they communicate with you like a human would? Oh, absolutely. I Just mean, like you know, talking? They, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, one of the ones that I know personally is is a great musician. You know, and I mean, he, you know, plays guitar and sings and does everything. They're, they're, and, and people don't understand. They're embedded in our culture. There are plenty of ETs that are already in our culture that we see and know because they're famous. And, and people don't even understand that. They don't know it. And, of course, they're not going to admit to it. And I'm certainly not going to out anybody. <laughs> they understand that. So, so these Palladians, they're just everyday people in the streets that we walk past could be one of these from this race? Some of them have a tendency to be very tall, be very good looking. They all look like they should be, you know, uh, professional models. Uh, you know, they should be, you know, TV or movie stars, things like that. They're, they're, they're exceptional looking in the fact that they, you look at them and you go, well, that's not, that person doesn't really look like anybody I know, but at the same time, they look like they, they should be, you know, doing something, you know, on camera. I mean, they're, they're, they have a a unique, um, the way they present. They're they're very, they're striking. Yeah, that, that wasn't what I was expecting you to say they would be like, to be fair. So that's interesting that we potentially interact with these uh, races without even, without even knowing about them. And see, some of them actually, the ones that are what I call newcomers, Mm -hmm. Um, they don't understand the culture particularly well, but they're, they're a bit arrogant. And so they cover it by trying to act like they're kind of stuck up and, and those are the ones that don't have much of a sense of humor. 
uh, they're particularly yeah. fun to be around because they don't get it. <laughs> and, and it's it's kind of funny. I mean, you could say stuff and they just look at you and you think they're offended. It's They don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, wow. Because <laughs> they don't understand the cultural references. And uh, they can get, you know, kind of pissy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so talking, you, you're talking about the greys and the greys I know from the bits that I've heard uh, you talk about previously that they're they're quite aggressive and they're not very nice uh, race <clears throat> um, and now you've talked about the ones that are are sort of more normal I say normal but more friendly and, and interact more you say that they sort of they are as human like really they are but they still have a lot of connections I mean they 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 typically, they have not only connections off world, mm -hmm. but they have access to a great deal of information. Uh, I mean, they're fascinating. The, the ones that I've met anyway, because I, I can, I can literally sit down and talk to them for days at a time. Uh, they can answer almost anything. Uh, they're extremely truthful people. Uh, yeah. it's like they don't even understand what lying is. Uh, they are exactly who they present as they are. So they're not out to try to make an impression. Uh, yeah. They're not out to impress you. Um, they're already pretty impressive people. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're what we consider to be educated. They consider to be, you know, sort of like uh, almost like hillbillies. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, they're, they're terribly, terribly smart. Uh, and, and they're, they're light years ahead of us a lot of times in terms of their understanding of uh, hard sciences yeah. Um, and also history. So, so it's like, you know, they, they go back. I mean, some of these guys live five, six hundred years. Okay. Or more. Okay. So, you know, so, so they can go back and say, yo, yeah, I remember so and so, you know, and, and it's, they're not getting around. I mean, they actually were there. So they, um, a lot of stuff has been coming out over the last couple of years with the, the Tic Tac UFO and, a lot more public awareness and uh, maybe acceptance of the fact that disclosure is coming. What what are your thoughts on disclosure? And also, what are the thoughts of the alien races? What do they think I of disclosure? I don't think we're going to get any kind of disclosure that is particularly significant. We're no. going to get, well, and I'll tell you why I say that because the governments of the world have been involved in cover-ups they've been involved in espionage they've been involved in all sorts of you know bad stuff and for them to come out and say oh yeah we've known about this for you know like the last 200 years and we've been involved in it and we've done this and we've done that they're not going to say that they're not going to do anything that implicates them in a position where the average citizen says, wow, my government sucks. Look what they've been doing. And what, what, you know, this is what they kept us from being able to understand and have access to. And they've been making deals behind, you know, our backs, allegedly on our behalf. But what have they been getting for it? They've been getting access to, you know, science and they've been getting access to weapons and they've been getting access to little bits of pieces of technology. Well, you know what? They could have had access to an awful lot more stuff. And they could have passed that information along to us so that we could have been partners at the same big table so that we could have taken that information and done things with it to make the world a better place. And they made, they assumed that they had the right to make all those decisions on our behalf. I don't think they did. You know, until we can get to a point where we can have some kind of understanding with our governments where we can say, look, you know, you guys need to, you know, stop treating us like children and, and start treating us like adults. You know, we're ready to, to, you know, consume the information for what it is directly. And we want to be part of the situation so that we can work with it. Until we get that kind of respect, we're never going to get disclosure. What we're going to get is like, you know, some postcard version where they tell us stuff to impress us and shock us and scare us and all the rest of it. You know what? That doesn't help us to to uh, you know get down the road anywhere positive. It just keeps us, you know, under their thumb. I don't want to be under anybody's thumb, and I don't want anybody else on this planet 
They have to be under anybody's thumb. I want us all to be equals and to sit at the same table, know the same information, and make informed, educated decisions. Do you think the alien races will force disclosure if the governments don't? Or do you think that's not their agenda? Well, I realize something, you know, we have to be careful when we refer to them as aliens, because, mm-hmm. you know, that's like calling humans all, you know, one group. OK, and there's, you know, as many different versions of humans and different beliefs and different, you know, agendas and all the rest of that. And it's the same thing with the, the various different ET races. And that is, is that there's lots of different agendas. There's lots of different levels of commitment and participation, you know, from people that could care less and all they want to do is just live out their lives to, you know, people that are, are you know, frontline, you know, ready to, you know, jump in and, and do something. And they have the same arrangement. So, you know, the, the, you have to be kind of specific. So, OK. Uh, yeah, I completely understand. Um, with the ranch itself, what mm-hmm. do you what do you think the agenda is with the ranch? Because obviously there's a lot happening there that doesn't <clears throat> appear to happen. Other, I know it does appear at other places, but why why do you think the ranch was particularly picked well, I think it was picked a long time ago, and I just happened to stumble across it. I don't think it particularly had anything to do with me. Um, I think I was just the unfortunate soul that kind of bought the wrong ranch. Um, but we, we've been told that this ranch has had two portals on it for as long as 8,000 years. And so many different cultures have come and gone. Uh, you know, certainly uh, as we've been, you know, working to do construction and things here on the ranch at various times, we found artifacts, we found all sorts of things that prove that. So um, definitely this place has a much longer history than when the buildings were built. You know, the land itself was here forever and various different things were happening here. It's just that probably for the most of it, there wasn't any settlement here to be able to, you know, actually make any record of it or or to participate directly. And, you know, when we got here, it it just started acting up, Uh, you know, just crazy, just crazy the way things are, have been here. Um, Never would have expected anything like it. In fact, I wouldn't even have believed it. If I had heard my stories, you know, and not been me, I, I probably wouldn't have believed them. But, you know, all I can do is say what it is. I've had, you know, multiple lie detector tests. You know, my wife worked for the FBI for years. I worked, uh, you know, with county, state and federal government. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're pretty good examples of people that, you know, manage to, uh, you know, go through the litmus of all the different, you know, qualifiers to become, you know, legitimate, trusted members of society. And, you know, here we are. We're, we're you know, the guys living on the alien ranch. So I don't know. You know, I, I always tell people, you know, they say, oh, come on, it's a big story. And I go, no, it is a big story, but it's a big truth, you know. And, you know, we're not out there trying to make money off this. You know, anything that we do, we, we're not doing for us. We're trying to do to make the world a better place. You know, I mean, we run an animal charity to, you know, help all the abandoned animals. Uh, you know, we spend the majority of money that comes our way. That's that's where it goes. You know, my wife works two jobs and I work, you know, two or three jobs uh, in order to pay for everything here. And, you know, we're not doing it because of the fact that we want people to pat us on the back and tell us how wonderful we are. We don't care about that. We care about the animals having a loving, safe environment with us uh, when nobody else wanted them. You know, and and you see, that's the difference between us and a lot of these guys that are out there on the uh, paranormal circus is what I call it. You know, they're all out there rehashing stuff that's been going on for the last 70 years and trying to put it in different terms and write it down in new books and present it over and over and over again. You know, they make their way on all the TV shows and all the rest of that stuff. And I guess they get paid pretty well for it. You know, more power to them. Uh, but we don't do that. You know, we're not out there, you know, trying to hawk uh, alien dolls or, or, you know, anything else. I mean, we're just, I wrote a book, you know, and uh, it's out there, but it's a book about what happened here. And that's it. That's a great point. Just uh, going back to your ranch, there's quite a lot of properties that 
are around Stardust Ranch. Do any of them, or do you know, like, have you spoken to them, any, anything that they say that's happened like on their ranches, or is it just more centred around Stardust? We have had, in the last couple of years, you know, since we did the uh, Ghost Adventures TV show, uh, a couple of years back, we've had a lot of people, you know, come forward and, and, you know, literally as we're leaving the property, they'll pull over and, you know, kind of stop their car in front of ours. And we don't much have a choice except to greet them and talk to them. Okay. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come out and say, Hey, you know, we own this property, you know, down the road over here someplace. And we've seen all the same stuff and our families have been seeing this stuff for 30 or 40 years. And I'm like, well, you know, more power to you. Uh, you know, sorry that you had to go through that, but thanks for, you know, confirming what we, what we know. Um, you know, if there's anything we can do to help you or answer any questions to make your life easier, you know, we'll be happy to do that. Um, you know, so yeah, we've met people, uh, the, what I call the newcomers, the people that, you know, heard about the story and decided to, you know, buy a house right around us. So I'd say could kind of enjoy the sideshow. Um, there's a lot of them that are totally pissed off at us because once they got out here, they either saw something or didn't see something. And if they saw something, generally it was something horrifying and it, it made them just, you know, like, my God, it's true. Why did we ever come out here? We hate you. Um, yeah. yeah, like that's my fault. <laughs> um, and then we've got some that moved out here and, you know, they, they haven't seen anything and they're like, oh, it's, you know, a bunch of crap. And I'm like, no, it isn't, but that's okay. So, you know, be glad that your life isn't being impacted by this stuff the same way ours is. So, you know, we, we get a little bit of everything, you know, and then we get, you know, we get sort of weird stuff where, you know, we'll get a bunch of guys that, just signed up to go overseas as soldiers and you know they all want stardust ranch tattoos or they they you know uh, you know they want to lift a beer and and, and you know come out and they, they you know bring beer out and they stand outside the ranch and get drunk and scream and holler and do all their crazy stuff so you know we get everything i mean it's just you know we had no idea that when we started doing shows or i started doing shows that we were going to have some of the reactions we've had because, you know, we get movie stars that come out, we get, you know, uh, musicians, we get people from all around the world that come out here. Um, you know, just, I mean, literally from every corner of the earth, we get phone calls and we get people coming out here. I change my phone number four and five times a year because it just gets to the point where it's, it's too much. You know, I get three, three, 400 emails a day. Uh, you know, Facebook is just, you know, I got thousands of followers on Facebook plus, you know, every day I get, you know, 50 to 100 new people trying to sign up. So, you know, it, I didn't ask for any of this. I'm not looking for that kind of recognition. You know, well, my mission in life, take the information I've been given, turn it into new technology and turn it into uh, examples, working examples of things that can make the world a better place. You know, and I'm not trying to, to piss off governments or anything else. We're, we're not trying to start a revolution or anything. What we're trying to do is create an opportunity for people to make good, well-informed choices to make their lives a better place and ask them to share that information with others. That's how we change the world. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I do appreciate the fact that from what I've seen, you don't publicly try and push the the narrative of what's going on Stardust Ranch, like you mentioned, other people no. do. So that 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 certainly lends credibility to everything that you're talking about as well, which which is not a bad thing. So I think that's what's captivated me about the story over the years that I've been interested in the ranch uh, is the fact that it isn't something that's necessarily uh, a talked about subject. Like there are other um places certainly in the u.s where there's a lot of media interest and uh and such well, like lots skinwalker of... you know everybody's all crazy yeah. about skinwalker ranch you know and the guy that owned it robert bigelow you know mm -hmm. he, he sent his teams here and they, they interviewed us for a week uh you know reenacted you know a lot of the uh fights that we had with the grays physically yeah filmed it, uh, you know, they wanted to dig the place up horribly. I mean, I was like, no, you can't dig the place up. Um, you know, they, they wanted to buy the place. Uh, you know, everything that happened at Skinwalker pretty much happened here. 
yeah. about 10 years before it ever happened at Skinwalker. And it's as if somebody took all of the information and put it into a database about Stardust Ranch and then created a scripted version and did Skinwalker. And you know what? That's fine. I, I you know, I couldn't care less personally. I mean, it's, like I said, it's not about we're, it's not a competition to see, you know, who can have the worst ranch. You know? <laughs> um, it, it, it's just, it is what it is. We are, uh, our ranch, Skinwalker, and there's one other one. Uh, I can never remember the name of it. Um, they're, they're all in alignment uh, geographically. You know, you can literally uh, follow the, the uh, uh, what is it, the ley lines or whatever they call them. And, and they, they all go right through each other. You know, we're the lowest one on the totem pole south, and yeah. then, uh, you know, it goes up from there, up to Utah. So I've seen um, on your social media the, the portals that you've taken photos of. Mm -hmm. Can you describe some of the, the craft or um, beings or what, what's come through those portals that you've witnessed? Well, what I would do is this. I would tell you the portals are the portals, and the and the other phenomena that has happened on the ranch is not necessarily portal related. Um, okay. We, they're different. In other words, like when we had been in this ranch about a year, year and a half, and my wife and I saw what looked like Roman centurion soldiers uh, walk directly during a power failure when there was no power <laughs> uh we were just sitting on the sofa watching a movie and all of a sudden the lights went out all the power went out next thing it was like somebody turned on a black and white old movie projector and they were portraying this uh pair of centurions walking from one corner of the house through to the other end of the house and they just disappeared out, out the uh, uh living room wall right in front of us they just walk right through it and disappear it was like somebody turned off the uh, projector so, how do you react you know, to something like that pardon me how do you how do you react to something like that because that's not oh, we, not even you know, just typically we were just you know miles hanging open and going oh my god did you see that oh yeah i saw that uh what the heck was that you know i mean we're normal people. It's not like we're, you know, sophisticated uh, snobs where, you know, oh, I do suppose we just had a phenomena, you know, <laughs> you know we're just, uh, you know, we're just people. And, yeah. you know, imagine the average person going through all this stuff. That's kind of how it was. I can't even begin to imagine what that was like for you. Now, we, we uh, me and Ash have been talking over weeks uh, over podcasts and, and to people that we talk to about the connection between i say aliens but the ufo phenomena alien phenomena and the paranormal and the link between the two uh, and, and people do talk that they're, they're seeing paranormal events taking place where there's cryptids being seen there's alien or ufo or unidentified aerial phenomena happening um do you see a link between all of the, the phenomena? Yes. Yeah. There, there, there's, the thing about it is, is that we seem to be, imagine an onion and imagine the various different layers of the onion being kind of like our realities. And for some reason, either, and I, I can't really put a, you know, a, a message to it in terms of an explanation other than the fact that the layers are getting thinner and thinner and the different levels of existence or dimensions seem to be interacting in such a way that all these things are now mixing together. And so, you know, we have things happening out of order in terms of time. You know, it's like time is, is uh, you know, things that have happened hundreds of years ago suddenly become noticeable in this time frame here and now. Um, you know, the, the various different UFOs that we keep seeing, you know, we see ships on a regular basis. Um, I'm sure some of it might be man-made, but I don't think most of it is. Um, I don't, I don't think that the orbs that we've seen for 20, 25 years out here, um, you know, that were recorded during the Phoenix lights, of uh, you know, March 13th and 97, I don't think that has anything to do with anything natural, uh, you know, man-made. Um, you know, we've seen 
black triangles that were, I, I'm convinced they were nothing man-made. Uh, you know, the, the energy coming off of them, the, uh, just the, the effect that it has on the human body. I, I don't see that. You know, I've, I've seen some of the most advanced, uh, human craft ever made that used to be secret technology. Uh, Luke Air Force Base is only about 12, 15 miles away and they have, uh, open houses every once in a while and they let the public go through and actually walk right up to some of these types of craft. It was okay. nothing compared to what we've seen. So can you describe the ones that you've seen? What sort of form do they take? Well, we, sure. We had a, a an example a number of years ago um, where we had some friends that were over and we were out in the uh, front of the ranch uh, standing around in the front corral with horses. And it was early evening and suddenly we looked up and you could see a very dense, absolutely black triangle object that was probably about a third, a fourth to a third the size of the entire ranch. And it was about two to 300 feet over our head. And it, it just literally appeared out of nowhere. Suddenly it was just there. And the horses were real spooky and they were you know, running around acting like they were afraid. Um, there was a, a very weird energy that you could feel um kind of like a, a real strong bass guitar kind of thing where you, you your chest you know like it interacts with you and you can actually feel uh the energy um that kind of thing uh it, it was just uh you know you, you could see the sky around the outside of it but for the most part when you looked up all you saw was triangle and I didn't have a camera or a phone with me at the time. And, you know, my friend told me, he says, look, I've got a phone, but it was one of those old flip phones and it didn't really, he couldn't really record much with it. And he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, call, call 911. Let's, let's see if we can get the sheriff to come out or something. And uh, so he called and, you know, we reported what we saw and a deputy came out uh, in a patrol car and, the license plate was taped over so you couldn't get the license plate number. The number on the vehicle was taped over so that you couldn't see what patrol car number it was. And the deputy that got out of the car had on a raincoat and he had on a slicker over his hat so you couldn't see his badge number or anything else. And it was not raining. It was, you know, we're in the desert here. It rains yeah. like twice a year. And, uh, you know, and we tried to get him to identify himself and he wouldn't do it. Uh, you know, he just said, I'm, I'm here to take a report. And I said, well, good. I'm going to need a copy of that. And, uh, he, he, he wrote down a bunch of stuff. And at the end of it, he, even though he was standing right there looking at this craft with us, he wouldn't give us a copy of the report. He wouldn't tell us who he was. And he gave us no way to be able to, to identify or, or use him as a reference. And we ended up uh, calling Peter Davenport, uh, from the UFO reporting center in Washington state and literally talking to him on the phone as we're standing there underneath this object and made a full report to him. And that was the best we could do. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's some experience. Where, where yeah. do you think, where do you think, or who do you think this police officer was? Well, I imagine he was probably a Maricopa County deputy, but I know because I've, you know, I, I used to belong to a health club here, a gym, yeah. and I'd see a lot of the deputies down at the gym and, you know, in the locker room and stuff, we would talk, you know, kind of situation where off the record. And, you know, I'd ask these guys, I'd say, you know, do you see this kind of stuff out here on a regular basis? And he goes, man, we've been seeing this stuff for years. And I said, well, why don't you guys, you know, get involved and, and you know, try to get a handle on this? And he just looked at me and he said, we're absolutely sworn not to do anything with it. We, we, we're not even supposed to talk about it. And I was like, well, so is that coming down from somebody in the state or is that coming down from the feds? Because as far as law enforcement goes, they try to avoid it the same way pilots avoid it, the way, you know, anything to do with anything official that would legitimize it. Absolutely, pretty much unspoken, sworn, never to talk about it. Wow. So is that the same reaction that you've had over the years, like in the past 20 plus years yes. from, from law enforcement? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, I worked in government. I mean, I, you know, I got all the badges and everything. I mean, I, you know, I could go, you know, any federal building, any state building, any city of Phoenix building. I worked, you know, in management. Uh, you know, I worked in the front lines of, of, you know, dealing with people in the streets. I ran, you know, big groups for, for uh, counseling groups. You know, I mean, I, I was way up there in the system. I wasn't like a little guy. And, uh, you know, everybody would talk about stuff that they would never on the record ever go on, you know, on the record and talk about it. You know, I mean, when Fife Symington was the governor, you know, he made a, he you know, he made total fun of it. Yeah. When was the last time you had any interaction? Are you, are you in regular contact with these different races? Has there been any recent experiences that you've had with them? Um, we have, let's put it this way. I've gotten to the point where I know certain individuals well enough that, that we speak regularly. And, um, you know, so it's, I mean, they're, they're, I consider them to be friends at this point, some of them. Um, they know that I hold their, their privacy, you know, uh, sacred, you know, I treat them the same way I would treat like a client that I was doing counseling, but, you know, we, we, uh, you know, just don't, I don't give out their identity, but they're here. And I mean, you know, like I said, Arizona's full of them and there are many different races here and they, they are, you know, I don't know if the rest of the country's full of them, but I know Arizona's full of them. It's funny. They get, they, some of them attend these conferences, you know, all these paranormal conferences. Yeah. They're there. They're actually there. Oh, really? It's a, it's remarkable. I mean, when I see them, you know, they're happy to see me and, you know, we, we usually go off someplace and sit down and catch up and, you know, have coffee or whatever and talk. I guess a lot of skeptics will say that you've had this going on for years. Uh, lots of these greys coming at you have had fights with, literally. Mm -hmm. A lot of skeptics say, where's the evidence? Have you ever set up oh, cameras to record anything coming? What's the, or what's the, what's the best that you've got, I guess? Well, you, you can go on our, our website, uh, you know, and see the DNA reports. I mean, that, that was done a number of years ago with uh, Dr. Levengood, who mysteriously died uh, right before we could go world, you know, with a worldwide news conference and sit down and show everybody on camera the evidence. Uh, you know, I know people say, oh, how convenient. Hey, you know what? I don't make it up. I just live it. Um, you know, but it was, you know, we had, we have DNA evidence. It's on our website. You can go to www.alienranch at weebly.com and you can, you know, you can see what we got. We get pictures of all sorts of stuff there. I mean, we got video, we got photographs. You know, I, I'm trained to be a professional witness in the Superior Court of Arizona and everything that I have done. Uh, I've done in such a way that it could be, you know, I could actually, you know, hold up my right hand and swear an oath and, and, and say, this is what has happened. This is what we've seen. And here's the evidence, you know, plus, like, like I said, we have physical evidence as well. There's a lot of people out there that don't want to believe for whatever reason, you know, there's the cancel culture, you know, right now with everybody saying, hey, you know, if I say it, it didn't happen enough times and it didn't happen. Well, hey, you know, that's fine. See, we're not out here trying to prove anything. You know, it's like if you're ready to open your heart and understand this for what it is and believe and know that something good can come from it, great. You know, if you just want to be a troll and, and you know, complain and say, it's, you know, a bunch of BS, cool. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me one bit. And I think that that lends even more credibility to John. And uh, And I know that's one of the things that's certainly captivated me over the years is the fact that you literally don't care if people believe you or not, which I, I've, I, I, I think couldn't is great. care less if they think yeah. I'm crazy, you know, <laughs> they think I'm crazy and that I'm just a shill, so be it. And I know that it's absolutely sort of extraordinary, the events that have, have taken place to you at the ranch over the last couple of decades. So, Again, I don't. I don't even know how you would even come to to get to any kind of acceptance. Um, but I know that you. I've seen the picture of the samurai sword on the on the floor with the blood on it, and right. I think I think that's where you got some of the DNA evidence from the the samurai sword. Let me let me explain that a little yeah. bit. 
the the evidence has come from the sword, but it has come from from um, when I took the head off of one of these creatures. Um, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, what do you do with a dead alien? You know, it's not like, <laughs> you know, it's not like you can send it out to be you know stuffed and you know put it over your mantle. So you know, I, I didn't have the foggiest clue what to do with it. And, you know, so I ended up, I wrapped it up and I stuck it in the freezer. And uh, I was fortunate enough that at the time I was uh, doing radio. And so I, I was able to reach out to some people that uh, had connections. And, you know, they were able to tell me exactly who to talk to. And Dr. Lovingood's, uh, you know, name kept coming up. And so they got me the phone number and I called him. And I told him what happened, and I took photographs of it, and I sent it to him, and he, he was terribly excited. And he said, well, you got to get this thing to me somehow. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm in Arizona, and you're in Michigan, and I'm certainly not going to, like, put a dead alien in the car and drive you there or drive it there. And he said, well, you know, chop it up, and I'll tell you how to prepare it and, uh, viv you know, vivisect it and all that, and we'll go ahead and ship it. And I said, okay. So I ended up shipping it by FedEx, and uh, it's probably – the strange thing FedEx has ever had. And, uh, you know, he, he got it in good condition and, you know, it was on dry ice and everything. And uh, so he, you know, did what he did. But see, that DNA was done under laboratory conditions in a professional lab, and it was sent out to many different universities. And they did not identify what it was. They just said, please tell us what you think of this sample. And, you know, I, a year and a half later, I've got all these major universities, and some of them are really respected Ivy League universities, making appointments to come and, you know, uh, take us out to dinner and, and, you know, hear our story firsthand. And, you know, so we did all that. So, you know, everything that was done, it was done under the best of conditions. You know, it's, it's a very legitimate, uh, you know, sample. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you for for explaining that. I I I'd uh, see, seen that you you'd got DNA reports uh, previously, so that that's good for people listening that ha don't really know the story or the the, right. the encounters you've had. Just to to clarify that for us, so that that's great. Um, and what... see, the, mo the most interesting thing about that was the fact that the DNA came back as not just you know like animal life; it came back as animal life but also plant life, you know, it had hemoglobin, uh, but it also, uh, you know, had, had some of the traits and characteristics of plants and they were mixed together. It was like in the same animal. And that's how they were able to determine that there was nothing like that on the planet that existed. Yeah. That is, that's, that is super strange. That is super strange. Um, in terms of, the, the future and with the ranch, what what do you see, or do you see that the communication uh, and your interactions with these different races um, will continue? Have they sort of advised you with what their plans are for the future? Or well, I mean, I you know what I I see the ranch doing is the fact that the, the energy here is so strong. You know, we've had people that have literally gotten off planes and wheelchairs that came out to visit the ranch. And the next thing you know, a week later, they were pushing their wheelchair to get back on the plane and, and you know, picking it up and, and packing it up themselves. They literally, you know, came uh, unable to walk and then left walking. So the energy here is very positive. But it, it, it's it's just very powerful, and it's what you make of it. You know, if you if you come here and, and you're you know really negative and, and skeptical, and and you know you you've got an axe to grind. Well, guess what? You're probably going to you know have a pretty scary experience here. Um, if you come with a positive attitude and the idea that you know you want to do something good and and understand something from a beneficial point of view, chances are you're going to have a great experience. But, you know, it totally depends on, on the people that come out here. And I explain that to people. If you're in a bad place, you don't want to come here. You know, if you just had a death in your family, if you've had, uh, you know, something terrible happen, you know, if you're really, you know, sort of on a depressed, ongoing, you know, bad mood, this is not the place to be. Um, so it, it's whatever you bring to the ranch is kind of what you get magnified back to you.
And do you think that the ranch feeds on people's emotions and their state of mind when they it, come? It magnifies it. Yeah. It magnifies it. I don't know that it feeds on it. Um, I know that, that like with me over the years, uh, when I was, you know, kind of going through my uh, period of time here where I was just angry all the time and, and just, you know, feeling very ferocious. Uh, yeah, it, it did more than, than take that energy and feed it back to me by, you know, putting all these grays out here and, you know, having them kind of do battle with me. Uh, you know, they took it out on my wife. They took it out on the animals. It was a, an absolute war zone. It was just, you know, horrible. Um, so I think it's, again, it, it's kind of like a, a big mirror, you know, a, like a reflective mirror that, that amplifies, you know, whatever you use, you know, bring whatever image you shine in it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. We, uh, as our podcast is, is about um, UFOs, alien, but also paranormal, do you think that spirits and the paranormal as a whole do you think they are part of the sort of alien phenomena? I say alien, but alien phenomena as a whole. Do you think they are one and the same thing, or do you think spirits are the dead, or, or what do you think? I think that what happens is is that that there's different dimensions, and I think what happens is is that you know normally speaking, uh, normal everyday life is. 3d uh here on earth and what happens is is that when you die you go 4d and maybe go further and i think what happens is is that there are certain places these portals open up and it allows things to enter that are 4d maybe 5d maybe 6d um and so we have interactions and so our experiences you know for the most part you know, 50 to 100 years ago, they were pretty much strictly 3D. And, you know, spiritually speaking, you had, you know, people that uh, would have, you know, striking experiences. And so you only had a few of those kind of people. And because the communication system wasn't well developed, you only heard about them locally. I think now that because we have the internet and we have the ability to do research and we have the ability to be able to, you know, kind of span the globe and, and, you know, be, you know, world travelers. I think we're having a lot more different types of interaction and a lot more just normal, regular people are starting to be exposed to this and they're opening themselves up to some of it. And I think in some cases, because they're curious that they're inviting some of these things to come in and, and deal with them directly that, you know, in the past that never would have happened. And so, you know, I tell people, you got to be really careful about what you want to ask for. You know, I, I get people all the time that say, oh, you know, I wish I had your life. It's so cool. And I go, no, it really isn't that cool. It's really a pain in the ass. You got to be really careful because you can do stuff and not even know you're doing it and have terrible experiences. And you brought them on yourself, but you won't know that because nobody talks about any kind of protocols or rules or procedures or anything else about how to deal with all this stuff. You know, I mean, we get people, you know, tripping out all over the world, you know, taking people on these little adventures and, and selling them for TV and things like that. Some of them are real. Some of them are fake. But, you know, there's no real instructions to people about, you know, how to deal with it. You know, you go to somebody in a church and they say, oh, it's all devils. It's all Luciferian. It's all this side or the other. Well, you know, I'm sure things cross over. I'm sure there's, you know, gray areas. There's dark areas. There's light areas. There's all sorts of things, but, you know, E.T. does not need, uh, I mean, if he's, you know, if, if E.T., whatever version you want to talk about is, you know, some kind of devil, then why in the hell did they need a spaceship? You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. There's so many contradictions and there's so much at the common sense level that if you think about some of these things, you can answer your own questions. You don't need somebody like me even to answer them. Um, you know, it, it just... We don't know a whole lot about this. You know, if you went back 200 years, 300 years ago and, and brought some of the simplest technology there is and showed it to them, they'd be like, oh, my God, you guys are, are you know, devils, you're, you're spirits, you're, you're, you know, angels, you could be anything. And, and it's purely because of the cultural ignorance that, that people have. 
you know, I mean, to somebody that, that you know, interacts with somebody that's from two or 300 years in the future, those people seem like they're magical beings. And, and you know, we, we have done that to ourselves in a way. I mean, some of these things are government projects that have been brought on us, uh, you know, Montauk, uh, you know, the Philadelphia experiment, uh, you know, various different things that have happened. Those things are real. And, and you know, those are literally energy portals, you know, very large energy portals and projects that, that you know, started and, and, you know, have introduced things. They've opened up the ability to travel between different dimensions. And we're reaping the harvest of some of that now. I just wanted to go back to an earlier point that you made. You said you were, when you have these meetings with the, is it the Palladian race, you are mm-hmm. work, working to create get a message out to better humanity just give us some more detail on what that is involved what you're actually doing to help or what the plans are to get this message out well over the years um a long time ago i had a a situation in my living room where i had an opportunity to sit down with three different races and as strange as this sounds because of all the weird stuff that was happening on the ranch one night or actually over a few nights, I sat down and wrote a list of a hundred questions I would ask if I ever had the time to sit down and talk to a real bona fide ET from the future or one that had, you know, advanced knowledge of technology, you know, cause I, I started saying to myself, you know, I mean, what good is all this if you don't have something that you can actually physically get something out of this, you know? And, and I said to myself, well, the best information, the best knowledge, the best uh, insights you can get. Now, that is something that is going to be valuable forever. You know, I mean, some people are like, hey, give me a you know gold brick or, you know, a big diamond or something that I can cash in and, you know, live off the rest of my life. I wasn't interested in anything like that. I wanted knowledge. I wanted something, you know, to, to be able to cure disease or to create uh, unlimited power. Or, or to be able to create, you know, technology that would uh, allow us to be able to heal people. And, and so those are the kind of questions I asked. And sure enough, <laughs> we got the information. We actually had uh, a couple of individuals stay with us here on the ranch uh, for six months. And they literally built examples of some of this technology. They built what we call a med bed. And that med bed could cure just about anything there was. They ended up building a generator that was the size of a microwave that could provide enough power to run all of Buckeye, you know, which is the second city largest mass area in Arizona. People don't, most people don't know that. They think it's Phoenix and then Tucson and so on, but it really isn't. Buckeye, from a physical standpoint, is the second largest city in Arizona. So, you know, we've had uh, all sorts of various different things that have been shown to us and taught to us. So you've had the, say the, you had this med bed um, built in your property. Where is that now? Has it still been used? Have you shared that with anybody? No, it, when they left, uh, they went back up to Las Vegas, Nevada, and they took it with them. And uh, they actually, it's it's a very long story, but they, they started trying to bring out the technology, not just that technology, but a whole bunch of different things all at once. And they, uh, with the idea that they were going to create a bank, a uh, financial bank, so that they would have enough money to be able to do kind of the stuff that I want to do. Um, but they, they tried to do it directly by producing it themselves. And they got in all sorts of trouble and ended up disappearing uh i don't know what happened to the technology it was in a warehouse it probably i imagine it got uh, confiscated by somebody but i've had no contact with either of those individuals now in uh, probably seven or eight years i don't even know if they're alive anymore cool thank you for sharing that it's been a a real privilege talking to you john can i do a pr for my book yeah go ahead (laughs) Um, we have a book out, and it tells all this information and a great deal more, plus it puts it in various different contexts, gives examples. Uh, you know, there's there's evidence in there. There's links to other things that are evidence. Uh, it's appropriately called Stardust Ranch, The Incredible True Story, and it is available 
on Amazon. Uh, and, you know, if people make a donation to uh, our trust funds uh, here at the ranch to go ahead and put into the trust to do all the good work we want to do, uh, I'll be happy to actually buy a copy of the book and sign it for you and send it to you directly. I should tell you, I should tell you, I, I actually, as a real person, I'm, you know, very few people that are personalities in the paranormal world will actually give you their email so that people can get hold of them and ask questions directly. I, I treat everybody, you know, just like I'm a regular person. So if anybody wants to reach me, they can reach me at John Edmonds 411 at gmail.com from any place in the world, and I will try to answer your questions. That's amazing. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for your time uh, today. We really do appreciate it, and it's been extremely fascinating uh, to speak to you uh, and listen to the experiences you've had. So all the best, and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I, I invite everybody that, that you know, has a, a good heart that's positive, that, that wants to be part of what we're trying to do to, you know, get hold of me and, uh, you know, let's see what we, can, what we can put together, you know, and the, the media and, and people that are doing, you know, shows, uh, you know, we would, we would love to have some people that want to do a movie uh, so that we could get this out on a bigger scale. It's again, it's not about the money. I'm happy to give the money to, you know, our charity uh, to feed the animals. I, all I want to do is get the message out there so that we can, you know, do more good work. That's what this is all about is good work.